Hi everyone and welcome to Sports Japan, the show that brings you the best from the world of Japanese sports and martial arts. Let's see what's in store today. In focus, we feature Kendo. Guided by an expert, we delve deep into the roots of this modern form of swordsmanship. And in front runners, we meet a former snowmobile champion. He explains how to perform some spectacular jumps. Then in top scene, we visit a robot sumo event to check out the skills of some home-built wrestlers and their inventors. Kendall. Competitors wear protective gear to fight with bamboo swords known as shina. More than 2.6 million people around the world are involved with kendo. Every three years, the World Championships draws competitors and spectators from across the globe. The word kendo, however, is surprisingly recent, having only been in use since 1912. The roots of kendo originate in kenjutsu. Kenjutsu was a means of fighting with real swords to defeat an enemy. In the latter half of the 15th century, following a battle known as the Onin no Ran, Japan entered a period of instability known as the Warring States Period. For more than 100 years, various military forces were engaged in conflict. During this time, there were many legendary swordsmen, who are well known even today. One was Miyamoto Musashi. Musashi is the most renowned swordsman in Japanese history. He is said to have won more than 60 duels. In those days, success and influence were closely related to prowess in battle. The Warring States period was brought to an end by the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu. Ieyasu succeeded in unifying Japan in the early 17th century, leading to an era of peace that lasted around 250 years. This forced the warrior class to find new reasons for practicing their swordsmanship. Alex Bennett, a martial arts expert, says that these changes led to the modernization of Kenjutsu. As samurai, as they were receiving stipends uh, for, being, uh, for their duties, um, one of their responsibilities was to always be uh, practicing the martial arts so that they're ready if they're needed. Uh, first, you get certificates saying, yes, I'm practicing such and such martial arts, so you can show that to your boss and they say, oh, good, you're doing your, your job then. Um, but on a personal level, it became a kind of a path for self-perfection. Yagyu Munenori was another celebrated swordsman who developed the philosophy of Katsuninken. His philosophy of self-development through swordsmanship had a huge impact and Kenjutsu became an essential discipline. So back then, how did the warriors practice uh, swordsmanship in detail? Uh, well, the traditional way of, uh, of practicing swordsmanship was usually uh, with uh, either real swords or blunted swords okay. or wooden swords. And, mm -hmm. and these were used uh, to practice what are called kata. Kata. kata are sort of like um, uh, forms of, of prescribed movements. They're sort of like sequences of various techniques. Kata are defined exercises for defense and attack performed by two people. One strikes and the other receives. Kata represent the essence of movements which were developed for experience on the battlefield. And at one point, each Kenjutsu school had its own secret techniques. But from the mid-17th century onwards, kata-based training gradually began to change. Um, a lot of these new schools were creating kata that have never been actually used before, 
and like a whole lot of acrobats jumping around with swords, making funny noises. Well, if we just keep doing kata all the time, um, then Kenjutsu is just going to go crazy. Okay. And it's, it's going to be completely removed from the reality of what we should be training for. Due to these concerns, Kenjutsu school started to focus on more realistic forms of practice, and this required modifications to their equipment. The Shinkage-ryu school invented the Fukuro Shinai, a forerunner of the Shinai, which could be safely used for practice. The sword was created by splitting bamboo into eight pieces and wrapping them in animal skins. It doesn't hurt when you are struck with it, so it's possible to conduct direct attacks. In 1711, the Jiki Shinkage Ryu school developed masks and wrist guards. Increased safety led to huge numbers of beginners taking up the sword fighting arts. At its peak, the school was said to have more than 10,000 students. Some of the traditional schools that revere traditional kata, however, objected to these developments. This isn't real, using a bamboo sword, it uh, doesn't hurt, and it's, it's child's play. Okay. Yeah, and so samurai should not be taught this because it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but the other argument, or the counter-argument, well, no, it's like we can actually fight and we can test our techniques, and it's a lot of fun. Some schools practiced both kata and repeated striking, while others only practiced repeated striking. That's why various different styles of kenjutsu emerged. So by the 1800s, some estimates say that there were over 700 different traditions. Let's take a look at how one of these kenjutsu styles was practiced. We took our camera crew to visit the Tennen Dishindu, which has a history of over 200 years. Tennen Dishindu training uses a bamboo sword for one-on-one -on -one combat and a wooden sword for practicing kata. The kata also include throwing and joint immobilization techniques. You can do quite well just by practicing kata. However, as the movements are prearranged, it's easy to lose a sense of urgency. That's why one-on-one -on -one combat helps improve your kata too, because each party can move freely without knowing what the other is going to do. The one-on-one -on -one combat at the Tennen Dishindu school brings one surprise after another. Firstly, the protective headgear looks like something out of science fiction. Our school allows strikes to the shins, and if you don't protect yourself properly, it really hurts. These are ice hockey gloves, and they're quite thick here. If we use kendo wrist guards, they're quite thin and not so protective. In standard kendo, strikes are only allowed to four parts of the body and they are the only spots that need to be protected. Tennen Dishin Ryu allows strikes to any part of the body. Therefore, the combatants require complete protection. Takatori Sensei decided to combine an American football helmet with cut tires to achieve maximum padding. There are no particular rules other than you have to keep fighting until one party admits defeat. You are allowed to attack your opponent with just your legs, and it's even acceptable to give them a good kick. If the fight develops into close quarters grappling, competitors can opt for throwing and joint immobilization techniques. Here, one combatant is throttling their opponent by forcing their protective gear into their neck. Tennen Dishin Ryu is practiced in this way to confirm whether techniques developed through kata can be applied in actual combat. We asked Takatori-sensei how Kenjutsu differs from Kendo. 
In Kenjutsu, you don't change your posture and you move right in, which stops your opponent reading your intentions. In Kendo, you have to jump into the attacks, although that makes them easier to predict. Takatori-sensei points out the differences in how attacks are launched. In Kendo, combatants leap forward to strike before moving past their opponents. In Tennen Dishin Ryu, the attacker walks or shuffles towards their opponent without jumping, and there is no continued forward momentum after the attack. In Kendo, if you hit and then pass your opponent, they cannot strike you back. However, in actual combat, no one ever runs off like that. So it's not just about striking your opponent. You need to cut them down. The whole approach of Kenjutsu is based on cutting down your opponent with your sword. Jiki Shinkage Ryu is a school that reveres this aspect of Kenjutsu. Practitioners at this school only take part in one on one combat with a bamboo sword. We took a look at a training session. The competitors stare each other down and take time to move in to attack. All of the strikes seem to be aimed at the opponent's wrist guards. The school also adopts a unique stance. Arms are kept extended, with the center of gravity held slightly back. A comparison with Kendo shows a clear difference in the height of the arms and the body position. We asked Hiromitsu Akiyoshi, the 17th leader of the school, about the significance of this unique stance. You extend your arms. This prevents them from getting too close as the opponent comes forward. It's a threat. You shuffle your back foot and gradually get it closer. When the opponent moves, you strike. Then you wait for them. When fighting with swords, the closer you are to your opponent, the easier it is to cut them but there's a risk of cutting yourself, too. quite soft, so you need speed in order to cut it. The main objective of cutting bamboo is to learn to wield the sword at the correct angle. This is known as hasuji. Hasuji refers to the ideal angle and the trajectory of the blade. If the hasuji is not correct, then there will be resistance to the cut, and it will not be clean. To develop the correct technique, students begin by cutting bamboo grass leaves. Then they move on to branches. The next step is thin...